fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. In the interview, we are doing a paranormal section. So, um, yeah. what we've got is we've got. Um, uh, She's a psychic. She reads tarot, um, astrology charts. And uh, one thing really, really kind of curious for us here is she does crime investigations. So joining us from uh, Tennessee, I believe, is Gail Carrier. How are you doing, Gail? I'm doing pretty good. Well, here we How are. are um, <laughs> now, uh, a, a, a true crime writer and a publisher actually sent us to you so and she said you've got to you've got to have her on the show you got to check her out um so what's all the excitement about <laughs> why what, <laughs> i don't she, know she <laughs> recommended me <laughs> yeah no so i mean well obviously she was really interested and very um uh excited about your crime scene investigations and stuff and kind of you've um had an impression on her. So um, how did you get into um, doing that sort of work? Well, I've actually been doing this sort of thing since 1985. And uh, it was just a fluke that I met some people who lived in Louisiana who had a missing relative, missing family member. And over time, it, not like a years, but uh, I, I actually ended up going down there, and I am credited with solving this case, except that this girl has still not been found. And, you know, I do have my own ideas what happened to her, but I have to tell you, not everybody wants to listen to me, which is the way it goes sometimes. Well, yeah, I, I would imagine that um, you kind of have mixed reviews with, with law enforcement and... Uh and with people in in that sort of field um i i, I just uh, so so how and not only that how do you separate how you feel about a case because when you're when you're learning something about a case it 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 evokes feelings in us right you know of course you feel sure. sad or happy or upset about certain things or mad you get these feelings how how can you define which is coming from you and which is coming from perhaps um a victim well what you have to first do is learn that you know your responses are just part of what's in your own psyche and I mean you can be very upset or angry or whatever about a, a victim in you know, the situation but yet at the same time you know you can learn and you people do learn to separate the feelings they have about the case versus the victim and it, and this is a crazy thing to tell you, but it actually seems to have come together more, uh, learning about this in cases dealing with children. Because, you know, they're going to be highly emotional. They're going to be very, uh, you know, in, you know, a lot going on with that. So if you don't learn to separate, as they say, the wheat from the chaff, you're, you're not going to do a good job. That's just the way it is. Yeah, I would imagine. And and so um, when you got involved, did you get involved um, via the family of a victim or something like that, or was it the police themselves? Well, sometimes it's been the police, sometimes it's been family, and sometimes it's just, I don't do this anymore, because, <laughs> but I have been known to pick up the phone and call and say, hey, this is what's going on. And uh, occasionally I've written letters and things like this. But over time I've found that they just see people who do that as nut jobs, so it's really kind of pointless. <laughs> well, and not only that, I mean, you could also set yourself up to being accused if you 
know something about the crime and you say it's psychically given to you and then they they kind of wonder well how did she know right so i'd imagine well, maybe maybe i mean that that's happened but a lot of the believe it or not a lot of things i've gotten involved with have been in other states and other areas so i mean i'd have to be one fast shaker to get from say north carolina outer banks to middle tennessee in the space of a couple of hours or something like that you know a lot of course a lot depends on the case but uh you know I, I don't mind. I mean, I, I'll take a risk and tell them what I see about it. And, you know, if that's, and, and then I feel like I've done what I'm supposed to do. And it's just basically up to them to whether or not they want to relate to me or contact me in, in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty interesting field. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. You know, yeah, because you, 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 there's, there's, like I said, there's so many, so many people involved, so many emotions. I could imagine. It would be a real roller coaster ride for you um, as you get things and find out things that um, you know. And it doesn't matter how many times you dealt with things. So I'd imagine it would be. It can still be um, upsetting. Oh yes, and if you keep in mind that some some of us go on actual crime scenes, and then there's evidence based on. You know, just the, just the, just what goes on in a crime. You're going to see things, you know, and potentially some of it's going to be somewhat, I mean, lack of a better way to put it, it's just going to be horrible. So that that's something that police officers have to learn, detectives have to learn, and to separate themselves from what what's going on. And that's no different than us. And even psychically, sometimes we see these things, but there's just so little we can do about it that we we just have i think most of us anyway just get to where we accept it and that's kind of kind of basically the end story yeah how how but, do they how do they treat you um law enforcement in all uh most of the time when i actually do police work they they treat me okay i don't have a lot of uh problems with them but a lot depends, too, of course, on the detectives involved. And I hate to say it, but some of them, I think, get a little bit um, weird about it. And some people have personal beliefs. A lot of people don't want to say they believe in psychics. They don't think psychics are going to do anything. And I can certainly appreciate that. And I guess that's one reason why over the years I've just kind of learned to take a, a well attitude to it. If they like me and want to work with me, that's great. But if not, you know, well, okay, I did my best. Hi there, it's Julie. Um, I just trying, just kind of going back a, a tiny bit, if that's okay. So, how sure. do you receive psychically? How do you receive your information? It just comes to me like it, it's a little bit like if you're just, you know, just think. If someone tells you something, I saw a wreck on the interstate or the highway or how they call it up there, you know, and, and then all of a sudden you see something in your head and it, it's about the wreck. That's just kind of the same thing about what happens with me or with any of us. You know, you just get these flashes that, that of how this thing came about and you just run with it. So would but you I've describe also learned this? something that you just know you just know that's happened right or is or is it visual or with, with my, myself my own ability would be that i know something happened i wouldn't necessarily see or hear although i may do but it, predominantly it is a knowing something like that but like a lot of times when people will say well you know a lot of people would say to me i'm missing a brother, and, and then I get a, a flash of a young man with, with, say, dark hair or, you know, something like that. I'll say, does he have dark hair and these kind of things. And then sometimes we do uh, a thing that's called psychometry. And what that is, basically, and you may have heard of it, is mm -hmm. where a person holds an object belonging to someone and perceiving information about the person from their objects, you know, yeah, a watch, yeah. 
these things of this nature. And I, I'm re- I, I've got to be, I'd be really honest and put my cards on the table. So I, I respect everything that you're saying and doing. My, my concern is, is with the uh, role within the police. And um, oh, yeah. as, a, as, an, as an experienced um, medium myself, I struggle with the, um, I, I suppose I struggle with the weight of the information we can give. And um, and whether or not we can add to delay and therefore risk to people um, by giving the wrong interpretation of spirit information, and that's that's this obviously something you've come across. Right. That that is something we have to take full responsibility for. And th- this is how I would handle it myself: is just to say, okay, this is what I see. This is my interpretation and, and try to, and, you know, maybe try to work with this person about that information. But, and I always say, I always preface this, look, you know, this is what I see and, and, you know, I could be wrong, but this is what I come up with. And I don't expect to be 100% right about it, but mm-hmm. I don't expect to be 100% wrong. I mean, I know enough about the investigative process to know that for a lot of it, it's just simply Occam's razor. So if you're doing this sort of thing, you just kind of get an idea of how things would normally go. And you, we know a little bit, a lot. I mean, well, I say that, but a lot of us learn, you know, just the typical things. Like we know that most people are harmed by someone they know. We know that's very true. So you're, you're you know, you're, you're moving more into technical fields. In fact, I have on occasion thought about getting a private investigator's license, but then again, I, then I've talked myself out of it, you know, but, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that it, there is a lot of responsibility there. So you just have to be willing to accept that responsibility. And it takes, you know, uh, I think I'm right in saying it. It takes somebody incredibly skilled to understand the difference between intuition and a message. Exactly. Well, you know, I, I think the one reason I tell people <laughs> how old I am is not because I'm, I'm worried about people being, you know, prejudiced about age or anything like that, but just to illustrate that I've been involved in this a long time and I've kind of. I guess what I want to say is that I have learned over the years that sometimes there are just things I don't want to be involved in. I mean, there is wisdom in that. And there is wisdom in, you know, understanding that that not all of us are going to be able to give the same information or the similar information. A lot of it is almost like a psychic opinion. But I do know that people... It's kind of hard to put into words, but when when someone asks me something, what do I think about something or what do I feel about something, to me, those are two completely different dynamics. Hmm. So if if someone says, what do you feel about this case, my thought on that subject may be very different than if they say, what do you feel psychically or whatever you want to call it about this case. And I, I guess for people who don't understand how how information is gathered as a psychic, you they, they would struggle with that. They would struggle to understand how you can differentiate and, and request that information at different times. Gotcha. Yeah, well, one of the things I believe, and you probably understand this too, is you reach a place, you reach this level where you, it's not that you don't care, that's not it. You just, you just accept that you know yourself well enough to understand your own limitations and you understand what you are capable of and not capable of. And I think that what happens after that is that that you grow from that and you learn about how to follow through the rest of the way. I, I agree, and I think it takes a certain set of um, of experience to be able to say, I'm not getting anything, or I yeah. Don't, sometimes you um, just don't, and I, I don't get a feeling for this, or um, 
I don't know how to make sense of it, so it's not helpful if I give the information. Well, I have told people, look, I, look this is probably not, I'm not the best fit for this. Uh, I've done it many times, and, and, and I don't feel any shame or anything like that about it either. But, uh, and I, but you know, people sometimes really, I guess the, work, the right way to put it is that some people are just simply desperate to get an answer. And I mm. just tell them, I say, okay, this is what I feel, but you might want to check this out to see if it's valid or not. But, you know, like I say, and, and I know you know this, but when you do this enough, you, you, you learn to accept what you can and cannot do, and you know what you can and cannot do. And if, if you're out and about and you perceive something, let's say, about someone, then I don't know about you, but I tend to hold on to it and let it, what I say, come around a couple of times, and then I, then I run with it. Yeah, exactly that, exactly that, three times. If I hear so, or if I feel something three times, then I'll voice it. But otherwise, I keep them. I think that's a good policy. And to me, I, people want to know what it looks like. It's just like a, a merry-go-round. It comes around, it comes around, and it, and if it continues to come around, and you know you've hit on something. And then, of course, we both know there are some things that happen that that it doesn't matter how many times it goes around. You knew it on the first, you know, the first yes, volley. Yeah. So in terms but I've learned, of um, expectations upon you, especially in your early days, so now you're much more able to gauge exactly what you should and shouldn't be involved in. But in the early days, how did that feel? And how did you learn to be sort of kind of as responsible as you are today? Because that is a process, isn't it, with us? So how did you learn that? Well, you know, I was. I think it's safe to say... <laughs> That in the early days, I was really nervous, and I was all so fearful of being wrong that I think I might have been wrong a few times just because I was so scared of being wrong. But after a while, you know, like I say, I've been doing this enough, and I had friends and people around me who were very supportive, who understood, you know, what I was experiencing and 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 I always made sure that I had people around me that were supportive. I mean, I did not mess around with people who were going to be mean to me or negative or any of that stuff. I mean, after a while, it, it just gets to be, uh, you know, I had to use this word, but dumb, you know, to keep going back to when you're getting hurt. You just don't want to keep, keep doing that. In terms of your... Um I guess again. How, I mean, how did you get involved with the, with the police investigation side of things? Were you because you're still doing tarot? You're still um, you're still very able to give give private readings. So how did you first get involved from from moving from that position to um, you know what was your first case? How did they approach you on your first case? Well, the first case I had was a case that happened in like I said earlier in Louisiana. This girl who was missing and uh, her brother actually uh, came forward and was fi trying to find someone to to help. And apparently, he knew some people here. See, Louisiana, where this case was, I have to tell you, it's a very strange state. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of the people there, I mean, they, they go in and out of, like, it being illegal to do readings or to do psychic things, and then the next mm. week it's okay. So it just it just goes back and forth. And so I think that it was just easier for them to just find somebody here to, to do it or somewhere somewhere else. And yeah. uh, I, was in, I was living in Nashville at the time. So, you know, Nashville pretty much is my hometown. But I, I even went down there, you know, and all this stuff. But the case, to me, will always be one that bothers me for several reasons. One is because I really believe that the person is, is responsible for her death. I don't think, I, I think, I, well, I'll just tell you, I think her brother killed her. I think the very one who was looking for answers mm -hmm. is the one who killed her. Because, wow. I mean, I just do. 
Does, it's um, all very uh, interesting. How much information, when, when you're um, undertaking an investigation, I'm sure this, this differs on investigation to investigation, how much information do you get about the case beforehand? I try not to get any. I try not to, I try to encourage people not to tell me anything about the case uh, before they come to me or, or, or if someone, if someone has to tell me anything, I always, I always say, please tell me as little as possible. Because I don't want the case prejudiced, number one. And number two, I find out, and I have to say, this is true. <laughs> I can't get away from it. I actually enjoy the work better when it's, when it's really more of a challenge than yes. if someone tells me a lot about the case. It, 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 it just works out better that way. I understand that. Totally understand that. And what has been your greatest challenge or even your, your, your greatest achievement, do you think? Well, the one case I did work on, there, uh, several I worked on, the one case I was talking about with uh, Al just a couple minutes ago, that one to some degree, but actually the one that I, I really feel did was the better one was something that happened a long time ago, uh, quite a few years ago actually, uh, a case where I had I'd heard of the news about this particular murder on the news, and this is what I'm saying that I... I just picked up the phone and called downtown Nashville. And they said, well, you know, that's nice, but, uh, you know, we don't believe in psychics. We're a scientific organization. And I'm thinking, well, of course you are, you know, but, and uh, so I, they, he was actually, I'll be honest, he was a little rude and, and all that, but I wasn't going to let that bother me. And I just decided, well, I'm going to go about my day. I did, I did my job, so to speak, and that was that. But anyway, what happened was, I mean, it wasn't but just a few minutes. This, the phone rings. I'm answering it. And he says, uh, this is so-and-so with Nashville Police Department. We just spoke on the phone. And according to this particular state law at the time, you know, you have to be over at the crime scene within about 10 to 15 minutes or we can have you arrested. And I'm thinking, well, that was a nice how do you do. But yeah. anyway, I just got in my car and drove over there and... Uh, and uh, what happened, the, the thing of it is, it was a young woman, uh, very young, really just married. You know, it's all a terrible tragedy. But anyway, her husband was out of town. He was a, a pilot. And uh, anyway, they, I walked in, and, and this is why I'm saying that you have to learn to see what you're seeing but not accept it in an emotional state. And there was uh, quite a lot of human gore all over the place. And I'm standing in the middle of this, and I'm, I'm not trying to absorb that. I'm trying to think, well, what do I need to tell these three detectives that are standing there? And I told them that the person that killed the girl was very young. He was from a deep southern state, and his parents were prominent. He actually, I mean, we can be stereotypes, you know, he actually came from a very good family and he, he, uh, had a, he was an African American young man, very young and wore uniform. And when I said wore uniform, they all kind of bristled, <laughs> but, mm. you know, then I said, and I even taught him his name. I said his name would be Kenneth. And I said he had gold in his teeth. He wore a jerry curl. He was this, he was that, and all this stuff about the state and everything. Well, there was nothing said, nothing, nothing for over a year. And one day I was uh, at home and this person called and said, Gail, you really need to get, get on TV, turn it on and see what's happening. And when I did, the news was talking about that case and my involvement in it. And apparently the guy was from Clarksdale, Mississippi. His parents were on the school board down there. And uh, he was African American, and he had Jerry Curl. He had gold in his teeth, and, and the name I gave him was the correct name. So I guess if, if I had a shining moment, that would have been it. And do you have any regrets um, from your work? Because we all no, um, no, I, no, not I've at all. Away, I've walked away from situations and thought, 
you know, I just, I just wish I could have made that clearer or afterwards more information has come. Uh, uh, and I don't mean um, detective work or police work, so I, I don't do that and I, and, I, and I don't feel I need or would do. But in terms of um, giving information and it just not being clear, sometimes you can walk away from a situation and, and just wish you'd been able to give more or been able to make sense of something in a different way. Sure, that's, that's a real uh, possibility, and it, I know that it's happened, but I generally just, uh, I don't know, I just do what I can and tell. I'm, I have a different approach. I don't really care if they, well, <laughs> i got to say this properly. It's not that I don't care what they feel or think. That's not, the, that's not what I want to say. But I tend to be... When it, there's, a, there's this part of me that shuts off when I'm involved in the psychic world. And there's another part that, that forms in view of the psychic world. And when I'm involved in that, that psychic part of me takes over. So, so and, and, and I'm nice about it. I say, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be so brassy or blunt or whatever, but, you know, this is what I get. You know, we can talk about it. This is how I perceive it. You know, what do you think? How, you know... But and, and yeah, I mean, there are times I think I could have done more, should have done more, but I also believe I, I'm at that moment in time I'm doing everything that I can do within my limits. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So I mean, earlier on to, and I can't remember actually if this was on air or off air, so I'm not going to say it again. But you you spoke to Alan and I about, um, and you mentioned your age, and. And I'm not saying that, that I don't think that's relevant to the conversation, except for um, <laughs> we, we kind of plan and map out our, our careers, our pathways. So in terms of yourself, you're highly experienced. I think that's the, that's the best way of putting it, isn't it? You're a very, very experienced medium and um, you, you've done so many things to get to the point where you're at. So what's your next steps? I'm trying to put together an anthology of all my ghostly events, things that's happened to me um, throughout my life. And I've had some very profound things to happen to me. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll say this, I grew up in the South, you know, it's a buckle on the Bible belt. And when young, uh, I was told all oh, this was wrong, you know, blah, blah, blah. Even though everybody in my family is extremely psychically gifted, it kind of just like, what? But, um, but I've had profound, such profound experiences that to me, in my mind, it's, it's like it proved to me that there is something out there greater than us. And I just think it would be a great way to, you know, explore that further and, you know, let her, you know, give everyone else a chance to see. And in, and in terms of um, psychic development, do you help others to develop their abilities? Yes. Do you, do you right, feel I do. you're born with it, or do you feel that it's, it's something you can evolve from scratch? No, I, I think, like I said, I come from a family where everybody talks about having had some kind of paranormal experience, and I, um, I yes, I do readings, I do read tarot, but tarot to me is just a tool. Um, but... I do teach tarot and I do teach astrology and I teach palmistry and all of that. And I, and I, and also I've got a class later in the month on development ESP. So I think that that good. was kind of fun. And you mentioned earlier the um, the, the psychometry, it's something that I I totally really enjoy. Um, but for some for some of our listeners, they may not fully understand how that works. Are you able to help us with that? Well, the, the idea is that everything that a person owns, particularly if they've had it a while, it has become imbued with your own personal vibrations. And so someone who's sensitive to this can pick up information about the person or the owner through those objects. And it can be anything. But I tend to like to use a wallet or a um, uh, set of keys. For some reason, that seems to work more for me. And you've never I don't been told know. by spirit why that might be? No, that's just something I've done all my life. You know, I've never thought about it. 
But I, I'll tell you something I do, and, and I really talk about this a lot. Um, I don't know how to put this, but I, I'm an artist, a little bit of an artist, and sometimes when people come to me in spirit, I draw them. And, and I, and I give, I just give the artwork, whatever, to the person, you know, and as, you know, like if someone's, uh, uncle or nephew or child or whatever comes through to me, I usually can draw them and, oh, and wow. put it on paper. Mm -hmm. Does that apply when you maybe go into a, an alleged haunted building or is it normally a direct one to one connection with somebody? No, I can do it. I mean, I don't sit around and draw stuff in a haunted building. But if I'm there later, I mean, later on, I can say, oh, this is what I saw and then draw out the person and then mm. the child, whatever. And when did you first realize that, that you could do all of the things that you can do? Probably when I was very young. I, I saw my first ghost when I was around five. And actually, it was a really cool experience. I'm, I've never had anything particularly bad happen to me. Now, out of all the things you do, um, tarot, astrology, and crime investigations, and haunted house, and all that stuff, what what's your favorite? I really, do you want to be honest with you? I think I like working with police officers in crime investigations. Because it is the one way to really give back to the society um, that, and it's so interesting. There's just nothing more fascinating, you know, than this. I mean, I, I'm sorry that it has to come about this way, but that is what I like to do. But I do, I do enjoy tarot and readings and all that, and I don't like to use any of that stuff until it gets to this point where you kind of want to, prove yourself that's what you were seeing and then often Tarot does that you see I've, I've never really been um, drawn to Tarot I have to be really careful how I worded that if I was honest I nearly said I've never been really interested and that's not actually the way I meant it but I, I guess it's the um, I'm fascinated by it because people um, actively use it with or without a, a psychic ability but I, I remember going to see somebody when I was very young and they said every card has numerous, up to 12 meanings and it depends on what card falls with the other cards, that that's how we understand it. And then I think I've been to see, or I've, I've certainly seen people um, undertake tarot where that doesn't apply. And there's almost, um, it, it seemed to me like over the, the generations, over the years, it's almost been uh, reduced in, in the skill set that's needed to really undertake a full tarot reading. Would, would you understand that? I'm not really sure what you're saying, but I will say that I've noticed over the years that way too many people want to get a deck of tarot and they want to know if they're going to get a boyfriend, a husband, a partner, a job. When really the tarot is much deeper than that, and uh, it has much more meaning than that sort of stuff. Not that those things don't count, but tarot is vastly, um, I think, underutilized. And I kind of, I, I teach it because I, I like to, because I like meeting people and and all this kind of thing. But I always stress that tarot is a tool. It's a a way to bridge that gap, let's say, between what's going on in the unconscious mind and to be put out here in a physical form. Now, actually, I'll tell you what I actually like to do in a reading is I like to do someone's chart. That way I get to know them, and that way I can tune into that person, what they're feeling and experiencing, and that generally leads more to... I, I am more fulfilled by that than, say, using tarot. But there again, people like the color, the pageantry, the ritual of tarot, and that's perfectly fine, you know. But that's just kind of, you know, the way people are. Mm -hmm. So, if you, um, how quickly when you sit with somebody do you get information? So, for I, I would ask for information. I wouldn't necessarily, although it does happen sometimes, get information spontaneously. Um, 
But when well, when most of the time, by the time someone's come to me, I already have a basket load of information. You know, and I, that, I, yeah, I understand that and, too. And sometimes yeah. I write it down, you know, what I feel, and I hand it to them, and they say, "Wow, all of this is what I want to know about." And but that, is that because before they arrive with you, before you're already aware that they're coming, aren't you? So you're, I suppose, for, for subconsciously, you're already requesting the information and the link. Um, I'm sure that has something to do with it. Now, I have a lot of paranormal things happen around me. Like the other day, I'm sitting here uh, in my den, and and it sounded like someone was pounding on the door. And I said, Richard, I said someone's at the door, and uh, and I, which was really odd, you know. And so he goes to the door, and there's nobody there. See, I don't do readings anymore. I don't, I mean, I do readings, but what I'm saying is I don't let people just come here or to me. I want an appointment. And the reason being is that my time is valuable too. And, um, and, I'm, and you know, I had the right to make that distinction at this point. And, and I really thought it was so odd that someone was pounding on the door and it was so loud and then there was nobody there. So I figured that somebody would make an appointment who was very desperately needing to see mm. somebody. And that's exactly how that worked out. Now, there have been times I will actually hear someone whisper a name in my ear, like Susan or Jimmy or whatever, and then I get a client with that name. So I've just learned to accept it. That's just, I mean, I, I don't try to explain it anymore. I just kind of try to accept it. Well, that's uh, it's it's just amazing. Um, have you have you come across like um, when you do some of the crime scene things? Uh, have you come across uh, times where you've been in touch with um, a, a person that's a murderer or a killer or someone pretty evil? Yeah, um, the, the the most recent case I worked on to where I feel that. I think I feel like I've made the right distinction in this case. Here's another case of a people, young people on drugs. They had a sister who knew about it. I think she got angry with the brother. I believe the brother killed her, and everyone believes the brother killed her. But the, but there's been a conviction, and someone else has been charged with the crime. And yes, I think he's a dirty bird. But I do think the brother, I think he is evil. I think he's a sociopath. And, uh, but this case is being reviewed. It's come up for appeal and it's going to be another trial. But I believe, I don't believe the person they have in jail is the person that, that killed, excuse me, killed this girl. I think that everybody was on drugs and they were just able to pin it on him. And there's a, there's a lot of stuff about this case and, uh, you can even go online. It's, it was, I mean, I've seen clips in the London Daily Mail about this particular case. But I told this detective uh, that I worked with that, that this girl was not intact, that they would not find her together, her all together. And she said, oh, yeah, they will. It's the way it used to go. I said, no. But then, but, and I even told them where I thought they'd find her body. Well, they did not find her body there. They just found her skull there. So that was pretty uh, tricky, you know. You, I mean, I mean, from saying that talking about evil people, I mean, someone's got to be evil to, to, to who have done that to this to anyone. What do you think causes that? Like, are, are you or do you believe in like demons and possession and things like that, or do you think people are just good and bad? That's a good question. <laughs> Tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. No, and I'll, let me say this. I think that there's a lot of people out there who do bad things. But to stretch it into being evil, it's hard to say. But I do believe that there are people out there who have, who's, who born, they're a bad seed and, and they will continue to be a bad seed. They will live their entire lives this way. And, and there's probably not a lot that can be done about it. I think it's just a simple fact that we have people on the planet. You have really good people. You have really bad people. And you have people who kill. 
and and we know that that's the case. But I, it's hard for me to understand. I mean, I, and, and the element of drug abuse and and all that is certainly playing a major role. And I was going to say, with with all of this going on in your life, and that, how do you um, fit that into a normal lifestyle? How do you, like you know. Um, develop relationships and and uh, and kind of still like like I guess what I'm saying is can you just turn it off so that you can uh, be away from it well I don't turn it off I just learn to set it aside I like being psychic I, I, I don't I don't really now when I was much younger and didn't understand it as well there was all this time you know like I, why I'm just being bombarded with this stuff but uh, but as I've gotten older, I, that's who I am. You know, I'm, a, I mean, it's not going, that's just the way it is. You know, I get up in the morning, I, I hear a word and I know that word's going to play a role in the day and it usually does. I don't have any immediate examples of that, but I feel, I actually, I feel rather blessed that I have this outer lining, this, this layer, if you will, that I get to draw on. You know, so. I really, I really like, I really like that. Well, yeah, I was just, I was just wondering how it would affect, you know, like when you're dating and doing things, like how, how, how you would bring it up. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm married. I have been for some time, and Richard, though they're asleep, <laughs> he doesn't care. Uh, he, he just kind of goes along with it when I told him about it. Uh, he didn't seem to think anything was all that out of the ordinary. Richard has a lot of education and and in the medical field, and he would say things like, well, you know, uh, there are points of, you know, medicine and things like that that can seem kind of witchcraftery and and weird. So, I mean, to acknowledge, you know, that I have a special talent, you know, I think that was just the way it worked out. Did you did you know? Did, was there anybody else in your family that had this sort of trait? Everybody, everybody. Oh. My okay. mother, uh, my dad. When my dad and I used to sit and talk about the paranormal and police work, he thought what I was doing was just an amazing, an amazing thing. You know, and he um, he was. And I will bring up this uh, off subject a little, but he was actually in the D-Day invasion. But uh, he told me once that there was just a gut feeling of things he should or should not do that he believed saved his life. Wow. So it's, it's had a major influence throughout your whole life and family. Right. So where do you go My from here? My sister. Your... Oh. Um, I, I plan to keep doing this for as long as I can or as long as I want to or whatever. You know, I'm not I'm not interested in quote unquote retirement. I like people too much. I like being around people. And the weird thing is, this is to do these kinds of things is 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 so social for me. I mean, I, I couldn't I could not envision my life not doing it. At least not right away. I mean, there are some things I've kind of gotten away from only because, you know, I have that choice at this point in time. But I like I like the psychic world. I get tired of some of the really goofy stuff I hear people do. Yeah. I mean, I don't go around the pendulum and hold it over my apples in the grocery store or anything. But you know, I do trust my I do trust my gut. <laughs> How? What do you think of 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 the way the uh, TV and and commercial success of of shows are on paranormal and ghost hunting and all that sort of stuff, psychics? Um, what's your opinion of, of, of the public, um, you know, and, and the way it's gone? I don't like it um, because I think that they've given a very uh, highly incorrect picture of the way the paranormal really works. I mean, these some of these guys, they go in and they talk about demons and this and come to find out with just a little old lady, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And uh, I, I just find that to be... I don't know, a little bit out of proportion to reality. So, so and I do. I mean, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say. So, what do you consider 
Uh, what's it, what 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 would be a good good thing for someone to watch, or a movie or a show or a book to read, or uh, what would be a good source for someone that was interested in paranormal? Where, where would you send them? Well, there's an old book, and it, it came out in like the middle '60s by a guy named Harold Sherman. It was called How to Make ESP Work for You. That is an excellent book. But, and you can still get it. It's hard to find, but you can still get it. And there are other books that are very similar, but, but that's the one I bought when I was a kid. And, um, but there's a movie. It's called The Gift. Um, I cannot, Kate Blanchett, I believe, plays the primary role in that movie. And Keanu Reeves is in it. But she, she was a psychic and she was doing readings and she got involved in a murder case. And, and I will tell you that some, some of the things in that movie are very similar to the things I have experienced. And of all the movies that I've seen, I think that one actually is closest to um, the real thing about psychic work. And the show, The Medium, I don't know if you remember that. It came on in like 2005 or thereabouts. Right. Now, as it, as it aged, it kind of got a little bit bizarre, but... But that that was also, I think, right on the right on the spot. Wow, those are some good examples. Yeah. Now, now, do you have a website so um, people can get a hold of you, or how do you, how do you like people to contact yes, you? Um, PsychicDaleCarrier dot com. It's actually morphed over into a site called Psychic of Nashville dot com, but. I actually live in Chattanooga, but I go to Nashville a lot, and I go up there and I do readings a lot, and I'm going up there next weekend. But, but um, I'm 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 about to have it rebuilt so that I can use it more. It's like a gel carrier. So. Wow, that's fantastic! And you, and you're doing appointments with people, aren't you? Like they can they can book something yes. with you. Oh yeah, sure. Absolutely. I do readings over the phone. I've had clients from all over the world. Uh, you know, I love doing readings. I like meeting people, and I'm not afraid of it. You know, that, and I don't think your friend would be either, but, yeah. you know, I get all this, aren't you afraid? I'm thinking, no, no. not hardly. <laughs> well, um, and, and so when you do a, a reading, like, let's say, over the phone, as, or Skype or whatever, as compared to in person, it, it, do you find it quite different? Is it, is it harder? Not really. I think I think that that when people sometimes believe it or not, when people call, it's actually better. And I think one reason is because when you're on the phone with a person, you don't get a lot of the little distractions. And but it it, it kind of um, levels out either way. You know, I have where I live. I have a lot of trees and a lot of birds, and sometimes they're kind of loud. <laughs> and they're fun, you know, I love them. But they can be a little distracting because they are loud. But that doesn't mean that they're so loud that I can't deal with it. But uh, I'm just saying that, that on the phone I don't have that type of distraction. Wow, it's interesting. Well, um, I guess this is, uh, you know, we're running out of time. It's been fantastic. We'll have your website um, linked to ours as well. So anybody listening can just do one click if they're on the website or go to it. Um, and of course, and what website can, is that, Al? That's thehouseofmystery.com. Okay. And, uh, of course, our guest has been Gail Carrier. Um, and uh, you can see her in the movie The Gift. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in, anytime you, uh, we, you know, you have... Uh, a need for someone that's, uh, you know, spiritually connected, uh, get a hold of her. And um, thank you for taking time and, and trying to explain what you do and, and um, what, what services you provide. Okay, great. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.